Welcome to, welcome to Empirical and Computational Research in UK Public Law. This is a Zoom webinar uh, presented by the Center for Comparative and Public Law at the University of Hong Kong um, in partnership with the public section of the Society of Legal Scholars. Uh, I'm Brian Christopher Jones uh, from the University of Sheffield and along with Eloise, Eloise Ellis, uh, from the University of East Anglia will be chairing the session. And I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, the speakers as well. Uh, so first up, we have uh, Dr. Mikolaj uh, Barsintowicz, uh, Senior Lecturer in Public Law and Legal Theory at the University of Surrey. He's going to be discussing answering legal questions with AI, state of the art and future research in UK law. And then we'll have Dr. Rachel Cahill O'Callaghan, a reader in law at Cardiff University, who will be discussing disappearing dissents, concerns about consensus. Then we'll have Dr. Alex Schwartz, associate professor at the University of Hong Kong, who will be talking about the changing concepts of the constitution. And then we will have Mr. Lewis Graham, research fellow in constitutional law at the Public Law Project and tutor at the University of Cambridge, who will be discussing, does the UK Supreme Court care about underdogs? Um, so uh, I, I believe every speaker is going to have a, a roughly 15 minutes um, to talk. So Mikolaj, would you like to start us off? Sure, thank you. Right, so I will, um, I hope this is uh, visible well. Um, so what I'll talk about to do, uh, today is, uh, is a research project, which is very much an ongoing um, project for me. But, um, uh, um, and if so, if someone's interested in it uh, to the extent that they would, uh, they, they might consider uh, joining a, a larger research team, then please uh, let me know because uh, um, from, for reasons you, uh, you, that will become uh, apparent to you, this, uh, it's becoming more and more clear to me that uh, th this is not the kind of thing that uh, one, one person can do. So, so. What, what do I have in, uh, what am I addressing? Uh, first, just uh, briefly by artificial intelligence in this context, I mean, um, in some ways, uh, you might think mundane uh, sort of use of uh, programming and statistics, there is, there is very little magic here. Um, um, and, but, but I do mean the, uh, at least the use of uh, techniques known as machine learning. So not just uh, this so-called old uh, AI uh, expert systems where you just uh, um, in advance decide uh, all the sort of decision uh, structure of, uh, of, of what should be happening uh, through if and then statements or uh, explicit rules, but using machine learning. So some black box, um, uh, will be involved, and what, what do I what do I want to do is uh, I want to replicate in a sense the only working um, well at least the, the only working tool that I know of, or at least the, the only kind of wor working tool that I know of, uh, I know of that was developed in Canadian law for for um, uh, for answering a relatively. Uh, well, it might seem relatively simple question, which is whether someone's a an employee or an independent contractor. Um, so, in so the Canadian uh, group did it for as a commercial uh, service for Canadian law, and I'm thinking about doing this for um, UK law. And um, uh, and I'm not an employment lawyer, so in a sense, uh, I'm. If, I'm in a sense less interested in the legal question itself and more in the tool and the kind of possibilities uh, that, uh, that it opens. Um, so you know, I will talk a bit about uh, the po po potential doctrinal consequences of, of, uh, of results of this kind of research. Um, right, so, so the example that inspired me um, to, to start this project is uh, what you see uh, here. That's uh, um, uh, these screens come from a paper. There you have a citation below. Um, 
the, and they present the interface. The interface is a kind of a form uh, where you uh, this, um, answer questions like, what is the worker's profession? Who owns the tools and so on? And once you, uh, once you um, complete this form, and uh, so what you get as a result uh, as a user is kind of a prediction, what a Canadian court would say, would is this, uh, would this be employment or not employment, a kind of a confidence score and an explanation um, in, in legal language why um, thing, uh, the, this prediction um, go, went this way or another way. There is very little detail given here uh, in this paper, and that's understandable. This is not an, an academic project. This is a commercial tool which is being sold uh, as a service. So what, what I um, hope to do is to, uh, to do a similar thing, but as an open source uh, academic project for the same legal problem in UK law. So what you might uh, think if you don't, uh, if you're not very familiar with um, AI or machine learning, uh, I think there, there is a bit of a um, misconception that uh, the, the way this is supposed to work, or at least, uh, or maybe some even are trying to sell it this, sell it this way, that you take uh, some source data like uh, leg texts of legislation or texts of court judgments, then you th throw that into kind of some kind of mod, ma almost magic uh, model, and then you get legal advice or answers to specific legal questions. Like in this case, is um, is would someone be an employee or not? Well, it doesn't really work like that. There is some, the, the, uh, because many of the steps that need to, to be taken to get to something like a prediction, like an answer, uh, something that looks like an answer to a specific legal question. Unfortunately, even when, when we are using uh, what is unquestionably AI, the process is very manual. Um, so what does the process look like? Uh, first, uh, well, um, one, once you have a, a question, then, then, you, uh, then you need to identify what kind of source data would be relevant. So in my case, uh, we're talking about uh, um, judgments or decisions of uh, employment um, tribunal, uh, the um, English Employment Tribunal. Um, then you formulate a hypothesis of what factors or vari variables uh, should matter for a prediction. Um, then you manually code, so you read every judgment and you manually code into some, some kind of a data set uh, each parameter. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. But the problem is that uh, the, often you realize after reading 20, 50 judgments that actually you probably should change your parameters um, uh, to, to, uh, to have a better uh, overall hypothesis. But then that means that you have to uh, go back to, uh, to the, well, to the first judgment and read uh, read all of them again, so so the, so you can st start to see why why this is difficult to do for for a single researcher, even if we're dealing as I am doing here with uh, uh, start at least starting with two hundred uh, decisions, and so once you have a, a data set, then you can start experimenting uh, with uh, different uh, models with different statistical techniques to try to build build um, well a model that would uh, yield best results. But what you will often uh, find in this situation is that I actually uh, to get be uh, best results, you may have to adjust your parameters, adjust your hypothesis and, and, uh, and improve your data set. So uh, three and four, those steps, they will often be in a kind of an iterative loop um, and you'll keep doing that as long as, uh, as, as necessary to, to get a, a result, and only then, once you once you get uh, once you get uh, reliable predictions or reasonably reliable predictions, you can uh, you can think of designing an app or a user interface like what I showed you. Uh, this company Blue Jay has. So data collection is um, is quite uh, quite a problem, uh, at least for English law. So there are, there may be differences in other jurisdictions, but on this example of uh, uh, decisions of employment tribunals. Um, so so it, it, it's quite a, quite a good illustration. Decisions before February 2017 are in loose leaf uh, 
paper, paper loose sheets of paper, uh, papers in boxes, which are being eaten by rats in the basement of uh, the Bury St. Edmunds County Court. Um, so, so if you, if anyone wants to use them, well, they would have to digitize somehow. But uh, it's also possible that this whole history of English employment law will be lost to to rats if no one does that. Since February 2017, we do have PDFs uh, on Gov UK, which can be downloaded, and that's what I'm using. And there is also a perspective that the situation will improve because the government now announced that the National Archive will have a uh, will have a database akin to legislation.gov.uk with um, proper API access, so much uh, much better for machine processing. So there is a chance uh, for the future, although the, uh, part of the problem is um, if we want to train models or learn something about the past, then uh, then uh, the question, uh, this issue of digitization of uh, older case law is um, will be uh, will remain a problem even if new cases go into the national archives. So so one uh, so having the um, the data or the court judgments, the this uh, stage of formulating a hypothesis, for me it means using academic literature, reading judgments. I can also use um, a tool uh, that HMRC has, which is a, uh, not a machine learning tool, much much sim uh, much more simple um, so decision tree kind of a kind of a tool anyone can use to um, sort of uh, as advice whether whether they are employee or not. So uh, so using all that, I, I try to identify parameters. A parameter for me would be something like a question: Is the claimant in the, in a given case free to work for others? Did the parties previously classify the relationship as employment? And then I read every judgment and try to code uh, uh, what, what would be the answer to that question. Um, so so I started with. Uh, 230 relevant uh, decisions from the Employment Tribunal from 2017, and and I quickly realized uh, ma many several other problems that uh, sometimes there, um, the description of facts is very sparse. There is very little information given, and so um, so it's difficult even to decide what the parameters would be for any given decision, and 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 also the decisions. That's a broader problem for. Uh, court judgments is that they are not formulaic enough, not repetitive enough to automate this task. That's why a, a lawyer, someone who, who can read judgments and understand them has to do that manually. Maybe in the future we'll have models for automatic feature extraction from the source data, but that's not uh, yet uh, available. And only then, so I'm not yet at this stage, which, uh, and this I plan to do, of course, working with statisticians, um, I, I want to tr first, uh, once I have the data set, want to try the methods used in some of the best papers uh, which, uh, which are uh, published and then perhaps try some other methods that haven't been tried before and, and see what could, uh, what could work and then uh, both prepare a kind of a, an app like BlueJay sells commercially but also publish the code and, and publish the data set. So these, were would, uh, th these would be the outputs. And so just to finish, uh, um, I wanted to mention what would be the possible doctrinal um, or, uh, apl uh, applications or implications of, of such a tool. So, uh, because I think that um, doing this kind of research can, only, can not only bring a benefit in terms of Giving like access to justice benefit or 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 benefit for law firms uh, to uh, help them um, uh, provide uh, their their advice more cheaply and, and quickly, but actually it may tell us interesting things about law which we don't see um, uh, today. So so yes, yeah, so so one thing that could be uh, discovered this way is what factors among those. Uh, in this hypothesis, actually uh, predict the outcome. Right? What are the their weights? In what combinations? So, um, so, so that would be an interesting, uh, interesting, interesting empirical result. And um, and what? Uh, but what's uh, what could um, fuel critical um, reflection about law is if we see some parameters like gender, 
um, and uh, other parameters that shouldn't legally uh, matter actually if we see them uh, mattering for the outcome. Um, and then we can ask the question, how strongly predictive are those legally irrelevant uh, factors, uh, identity of the judge, gender of the claimant, and so on. So uh, um, it might, we might learn that actually those, uh, um, those legally irrelevant factors or factors that should be legally irrelevant are actually quite strongly predictive. And in that case, that, would, uh, that may give a strong case either for le legal reform or for um, some kind uh, well, uh, training of judges, um, different solutions uh, could be applied. And um, yes, if, uh, and if we have a data set that goes, uh, that covers a longer period of time, there may be a, um, a, a hope for trying to identify how those different factors and their predictive uh, power or their correlation with result changes, how it changes over time. So it could be a, a, a unique uh, a strategy to try to look at uh, legal change at, uh, uh, off on specific legal questions um, over, uh, yes, over time. Um, and of course, I think this, this, could, be, this could be also published as, uh, as pure, empirically informed uh, doctrinal uh, legal research. So, as I said, I'm I'm nowhere nowhere that uh, near that stage yet, and and I am uh, looking for collaborators uh, for this broader research project. So, uh, if you're interested, then uh, do do um, do contact me. Thank you. Okay, Mikhail, that was very illuminating. I mean, I think artificial intelligence is something most of us don't know a lot about, but it's certainly a very interesting topic. Um, thank you so much. That was that was really good and very informative. Um, I think we have Rachel next, who's going to talk about disappearing dissents and concerns about consensus. I'll hand over to you, Rachel. Rachel, I think you're muted. I have slides that I need to share. Is it? We could see them. Possible? They did pop up. Oh, did they? Fabulous. They did. Right. Are they Not back at the up moment. again? They're there. Yes, they are. Fabulous. OK, yep. that's all I needed. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I suppose my starting point is that I'm a big fan of dissent. All right. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is patterns of decision making in the Supreme Court. So different to Michelin, it's not going to be highly complex. All I do is simply count. But what I want to talk about is patterns that have started to emerge in the court that are causing me concern, particularly from the position I stand, where I think dissent is really important. So if we can now. Next slide. Fabulous. So I do understand that there is opposition to dissent, that it is disruptive, that it creates uncertainty. And I'm happy to agree with all those arguments against dissent. But I think dissent is hugely important, not only for arguments about legitimacy that Lynch puts forward in 2003, but it enhances transparency. It um, demonstrates, overtly demonstrates judicial independence. And for me, what's really important is the overt reflection of different views and different opinions happening behind closed doors, behind, inside the decision making. And Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as well has noted that dissent has a really refining effect. So she has said that an impressive dissent can lead the author of the majority to refine and clarify their initial circulation. But a dissent does more than that. A dissent refines decision making. So in law, we don't know what a good decision looks like. We don't know what the correct decision is. But in psychology, there are experiments that show you what a correct decision is. And the research from this would suggest that better decisions are made if deciders are different. And particularly 
if we have somebody in the room in a panel who dissents, it stimulates creativity and divergent thought. But what I'm most interested in is the idea that dissent will less bias in as such, not, not the bias perhaps that Michelage is looking for, that bias against people who are traditionally discriminated against, but rather bias or a propensity to promote a certain legal principle or a certain precedent or a certain idea. And what the work in psychology suggests is that a dissent, an effective dissent, can disrupt that form of bias. And this is particularly important when there's perhaps a pressure to conform or a pressure to agree. And these pressures include things like institutional pressures and emergence of a norm of consensus. But the work of Alan Patterson also suggests that collegiality can encourage agreement. And those sort of pressures as on an individual who also has pressures of time and effort if they have to write a dissenting opinion and also perhaps sacrifice collegiality. So these aren't overt pressures to conform and agree, but rather pressures that encourage agreement, maybe less consciously. But also pressure puts psychological dis uh, pressure or dissent puts psychological pressure on the individual. So if you want to dissent alone, you're under much more significant psychological pressure. And the work of Ash would suggest that you're more likely to buckle on the, under that sort of pressure if you're going for it alone. So it's much easier to dissent if you've got somebody with you. And so if you think about dissent as really important to disrupt, to refine, to make sure that we have better decision making. And if we consider overt dissent, so a published dissent, as evidence of that happening behind closed doors, because we have no idea what happens behind closed doors. Alan suggests there's lots of disagreement, but in the absence of the knowledge that Alan has, the only knowledge I have is published dissent. I have some concern about the disappearance of disagreement in the Supreme Court. So when the court opened, which is the first three orange lines here, that's um, Lord Phillips, who was the first president of the court, dissent was kind of one in four. Disagreement was one in four. So one in four cases, somebody had some other position on the disposition of the case. This reduced then during the tenure of Lord Newberger, which is the five years below that, down to a low during Lady Hale's tenure of about 16%. And then it's increasing again under Lord Reid, but not significantly, and certainly not back to the rate of dissent that you would have seen when the court opened. What I'm particularly concerned about is this. So here in the black line, you see minority, and that would be where two or more justices disagree on the disposition of the case and publish a dissenting opinion. But what we see in the grey is lone dissents, individuals who are prepared to stand alone and disagree overtly. And that's what's disappearing in the Supreme Court. And I think Alan's work, and I'm not laying blame at any door, but Alan's work suggests that there is a, the president of the court has a huge and really important role in creating a culture of decision-making within the court. And they're also in control of some of the structures inside of the court. And I suppose here we have the four presidents, Lord Phillips, Lord Newberger, Lady Hale, and Lord Reed, the current president. And what you can see over time is this emergence of a disappearing of the lone dissent from 12% during Lord Phillips' tenure down to 1%, although Lord Reed hasn't had many cases yet, but it's starting to disappear. And that disappearance emerged in Lord, during Lord Newberger's tenure, and it's just been retained, if not ameliorated, over time. And that's partly related to the structural changes that a president um, has encouraged. So, the president, it is in the president's 
decision as to whether the core constitutes an expanded panel or relies simply on a panel of five for the standard panel. And in one way, you can see that it would be easier to have dissent in an expanded panel because there's more people, there's somebody else who possibly will agree with you. And that's absolutely true. So as the panel sizes increase, you are more likely to get dissent. And that's partly as well, because you're more likely to have people who think divergently. The more people you have there, the more likely you to see divergent thought. So there's a statistical relationship between the size of the panel and the rate of dissent. But there's also a relationship between the size of the panel and the president. Lord Phillips constituted of expanded panels in 27% of cases. And this decreased over time during Lady Hale had only 9% of cases that she thought were deserving of an expanded panel. Now, I'm not sure the nature and form of the cases were so significantly different during Lady Hale's tenure that only 9% required an expanded panel based on Lord Phillips's criteria, but that's what you started to see. And Lord Reid has started to reconstitute expanded panels, but not at the same rate. So this in part could explain the disappearance of the single descent. There's also a relationship between the types of cases that are heard in the Supreme Court. Now, lots of authors have shown that cases that raise a human rights argument and Lord Kerr would agree, the judge is required to exercise maybe more discretion perhaps, but they're more likely to see a dissenting opinion. And this is absolutely true. So you're more likely to have a dissent in a case that raises a human rights argument. What's interesting perhaps is that we're starting to see less cases in the Supreme Court that are raising those sort of arguments. And this in turn may, be responsible for a reduction in dissent. But ultimately, the decision to dissent, to incur the costs of collegiality, time, effort, and also bear those psychological burdens, lies on the individual who chooses to dissent. And what you can see here is uh, the kind of order of emergence of justices in the court and you can see the original court at the top and then some of the emerging um, justices at the bottom. I don't have space on a table like this for a slide to show you everybody. But what is happening is that what you see is that the judges, individual judges, are likely to be in the minority, whether with somebody else or alone, in about 7% of cases during Lord Phillips's tenure. But this starts to reduce over time to about 5% of cases during Lord Newberger's tenure. And then that starts to reduce even further in Lady Hale's and is about maintained in Lord Reed's. But what I'm, so you can see some of the high dissenters, Lord Kerr was well known um, for his dissent. But what you can see is kind of an average of seven or 8% during Lord Phillips's the kind of initial court, and that starts to reduce. And what concerns me, I suppose, is those justices that don't dissent. So what starts to concern me is justices perhaps like Lord Black or Lord Lloyd-Jones, who start to not dissent. And that may be a facet, I suppose, of the appointment process and who's in the room and what they value when they appoint. Here we have Lord Newberger, and it, it is well known that Lord Newberger made these statements about not liking dissent. Now, Alan Patterson has written a beautiful piece about the fact that he wanted a more collegiate court. He wanted decision-making to look different and more collegiate. But as a consequence, perhaps, he secured to the bench those who were less likely to disagree. And you can start to see a pattern of that emerging over time. It's not hugely significant for individuals, but when you think of a panel of five, if you've got justices who won't disagree, you'll start to see that disappearance of dissent. But also, you will have no 
evidence, external evidence of that really important reflective disagreement happening behind closed doors. Lord Briggs is a clear exception here, but I'd like you to look at three of the justices here. Two, perhaps at the top, Lord Kerr here, and you can see his, his rate of dissent was about 13% overall. Uh, Lord Mance, who was more reflective of the court at that time, about 8%. Lord Briggs, who is achieving the same sort of rate of um, disagreement, and he was appointed during Lord Newberger's term. Lord Lloyd-Jones, who's 4%, and Lady Black, who's hidden by my thing, but has only dissented in one case, as far as I can remember. And what I was concerned about was whether we could see these patterns long before they appeared on the court. So could you see in the Court of Appeal a pattern of decision making that maybe would hint to the idea that these judges won't overtly dissent on the Supreme Court? And the answer is yes. You can start to see these patterns, not for everybody. There's exceptions everywhere. But the Court of Appeal decision making is very different. For those of you who've read the cases, firstly, they decide far more cases. They tend not to dissent on their own. So the rate of dissent is much lower in the Court of Appeal. But inside the concurring judgment is where they put their element of overt disagreement, perhaps not on the disposition of the case, but that's where you'll find disagreement. And indeed, this pattern is starting to emerge in the Supreme Court. But the question I was asking here was those who are prepared to have their voice heard, are they more likely to dissent in the Supreme Court? And the answer is yes. So I looked at 201 of Lady Hale's cases and in about 25% of those cases, she wrote a judgment. She wrote a judgment in the Court of Appeal and um, some of those were dissenting, about 2% of those were dissenting. Lord Mance was similar, his voice was heard in 30% of cases and he dissented in 3% of cases. What's more interesting perhaps is Lady Black heard 383 cases and never dissented in one. I've only looked at 62 of Lord Lloyd-Jones's, but again, you don't see dissent. And Lord Briggs, uh, his pattern of decision making is similar to that that you would have seen in the Supreme Court. So I suppose in conclusion, what I would argue is that opposition in the Supreme Court has advantages well beyond legitimacy. It is overt publication of a dissent is evidence of that refining decision making behind closed doors and the limitation of bias that that could perpetuate. But I am really concerned that dissent has started to disappear and those who are alone prepared to stand alone are less frequently appointed to the bench. The Court of Appeal analysis suggests those patterns are evident before appointment and perhaps that should be a new facet of our selection process. Thank you very much everybody for your attention. Thanks a lot, Rachel. That's fascinating. I know there's a lot of slides there that I'd like to use in my classes. <laughs> um, you can have them. <laughs> um, I should have said earlier as well, we're going to take questions at the end. Um, but if you have questions, please go ahead and put them uh, on the chat. I see that we already have uh, a few questions up there. So thank you so much uh, for that. Um, now uh, we're going to be moving on to Alec Schwartz. Um, who's going to be talking about uh, the changing concepts of the Constitution. So, Alex, go for it. Uh, can everyone see my uh, screen, which I've just shared? Can you see the, uh, the slides? They're, uh, they're yes, coming up for good. us, Alex. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so this uh, paper deals with uh, a big question, uh, you might say a central obsessive concern uh, for UK public law scholars, which is how or has the UK's constitution changed? Uh, we know that there have been various uh, changes since the late 1990s that have altered how public power is 
allocated and exercised in the UK. So the Devolution Acts, the Human Rights Act, the Constitutional Reform Act, etc. But scholars have often disagreed about how constitutionally significant these changes have been. Uh, some would claim that the reforms have effectively created a new constitution supplanting the old one. Others are less impressed and see more continuity at play. I think one of the reasons why this question remains uh, a thorny one is that the UK's constitution is strange in that it's not codified in any canonical legal form. And so change cannot be simply reduced to just tallying up formal uh, amendments. So many would say the UK constitution is still largely a matter of informal, tacit understandings of various concepts, values, principles that shape ideas about constitutional propriety, and these inform the discursive practice that political elites engage in, in exercising and contesting public power. Uh, but because those understandings aren't codified in any canonical way, you might think then that this aspect of the Constitution can change through discursive change as people, particularly specific political elites in Parliament and in government begin to use and maybe understand the concepts, values in, uh, in a different way. And so constitutional change in the UK may be partly a matter of change, uh, I would suggest, in elite discourse, driving or reflecting semantic change about the various concepts or principles, uh, what they mean, their relative constitutional weight, etc. So that leads to another thorny question, which is how do we gauge constitutional change in the UK? Um, informal semantic changes in the discourse are bound to be pretty difficult to detect and measure, certainly more difficult than formal constitutional amendments would be. So this paper takes up that challenge and it uses some uh, relatively recent innovations in machine learning, natural language processing methods to estimate semantic change within the conceptual scheme of the UK's constitution, at least in so far as that change might be reflected in a particular forum of elite discourse, which in the case of this paper is parliamentary debate. So, um, to identify one potential field of semantic change in constitutional discourse, the paper proposes the idea of constitutional resonance as a way of capturing something that I think uh, might be important, which is defined in the paper as the extent to which the meaning of a concept is bound up with and thus contributes to the more broader meaning uh, or the meaning of the broader concept of the UK's constitution. And the idea then is that semantic conceptual in the UK, uh, change in the UK's constitution might be a, partly a matter of change in constitutional resonance that certain concepts may have become more or less uh, semantically related to the concept of the UK's constitution since New Labour's reforms. And I think that at, at root, this is actually what's going on in a number of, uh, of, of, of ideas or arguments that have been put forward by various Scholars, so I outlined some expectations of semantic change there, kind of eliciting those from the literature. So, for example, we might think that there is generally less an association of unwritten form with the UK's constitution since the late 1990s. Uh, Vernon Bogner, for example, says that the new constitution, as he calls it, of the UK, which was created in his view by New Labour's reforms, is more a product of deliberate design, more reliant on statutory form less reliant on unwritten norms. And in a similar vein, uh, Martin Lachlan suggests that one consequence of New Labour's reforms is that in the British context for the first time, the dominant meaning of the notion of the constitution has been aligned with a more modern template of constitution as a, as in his words, quote, a normative framework protected by law, laying down the terms of the compact between citizens and government. So that's one expectation about semantic change in the UK's constitutional scheme. Um, there are particular expectations in relation to particular concepts. So we might expect an increased constitutional resonance uh, around certain concepts. So obviously, I think devolution is one, right? So uh, with the introduction of devolution uh, acts, statutory recognition of the civil convention and so forth all over the last 20 years, it would be, we might expect a striking increase then in the constitutional 
resonance of devolution. If that is talking about devolution becomes more like talking about the constitution or talking about the constitution becomes more like talking about devolution. Uh, another concept that might have gained constitutional resonance you might expect is the concept of human rights. So the Human Rights Act opens up a bunch of new channels for the language of human rights to flow into the mainstream of British constitutional uh, discourse. So we might think that this concept or this bundle of concepts, you might think, have acquired greater constitutional resonance as a result of the Human Rights Act and the various ways in which it's now not just enforced in the courts, the idea of human rights is enforced in the courts, but also uh, formally part of parliamentary discourse in a way that it wasn't before. So um, we could also think about decreases in constitutional resonance in relation to a number of concepts. And I think most significantly, the concept of parliamentary sovereignty, uh, which you know, previously many people would have thought was the, 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 the prime principle of the UK's constitution. But claims about parliamentary sovereignty these days tend to be accompanied by all kinds of caveats and qualifications that in practice, if not in law, the principle it no longer holds, or if it does, it no longer has the same weighty significance that it might have once had. So we might think then the concept of parliamentary sovereignty now contributes less to the meaning of the UK's constitution than it once did. So those are some expectations, some hypotheses, if you will, about semantic change. Um, how do I go about testing these? Well, so that's where the, the fancy machine learning computational methods come in. So I use uh, um, a, a fam, a, one of a family of methods, word embedding, which is a computational method modeling semantic relationships between words. Each unique word or token within a corpus of text gets its own vector. A vector is just a, a row of numbers uh, that locates the word very much the way, the same way that uh, latitude and longitude locate a position on a map of the world. The word vectors locate a word within a multi map dimensional mathematical space, which is effectively a kind of semantic map of the corpus. So words with relatively similar or relatively related meanings will be embedded within that semantic map relatively closer to one another, that is within the vector space. Uh, to produce the word embeddings, I use um, a uh, one of the word to vec algorithms. These were developed by Google a few years back. Uh, these train, these algorithms train a model, this is unsupervised machine learning, train a model to predict a word from its surrounding context or alternatively to predict the surrounding context of a word. The byproduct of that machine learning process is a bunch of word vectors which encode multiple dimensions of semantic relations between the various words. So the more semantically similar or related one word is to another, the closer those words will be placed within the model's vector space. And you can then use the angle between any two vectors to compute a measure of their semantic similarity, which is a cosine similarity. Uh, so it gives you a, a way of, of, of estimating how closely uh, related one word is to another semantically within, at least within the corpus of text that you've used to train the word embedding model. So uh, let me say a couple more technical things about the process for this particular project. So uh, first of all, is the, the, the main, the first thing is to create a corpus of text. So in this case, I scraped a bunch of parliamentary debate text from the Hansard website. Um, this amounted to 11,160 parliamentary debates. Uh, for a total of 200,625,472 words. So that's lots of text as data to train the models on. Uh, it's not the entirety of the Hansard. The paper explains uh, precisely how the debate texts were selected, but in a nutshell, they were selected because they spoke about the various concepts of interest that uh, were relevant to the project. Um, that text is then processed for particular phrases of interest. So. A phrase like parliamentary sovereignty, unless you process the text, would be treated as two separate words. So each of those parliamentary would get its own vector, sovereignty would get its own vector, but of course that's not what you want. So I collapse those into one sign, parliamentary sovereignty, and then I bundle that together with other phrases that presumably refer to the same thing. So the sovereignty of parliament also gets the same vector. Likewise with British constitution, which turns out to be the most common way within parliamentary debate, that parliamentarians refer to the UK's constitution, that is collapsed to a single sign and then bundled together with other phrases that, you know, like our constitution, 
the Constitution of the United Kingdom, et cetera, get bundled together so that they share a common sign. Then the corpus of text is divided into chronological slices because I'm interested in semantic change in the concepts over time. That entails a decision about how do you slice the corpus up. So um, I thought it best to divide the corpus up into uh, turnover and party political control of government. So there's a conservative Thatcher major era followed by a new labor era, followed by a coalition era, et cetera. So I can create estimates of, of, of constitutional resonance for the concepts I'm interested for each of those periods of time. So to create those estimates, multiple models are trained for each time slice. Uh, why multiple models? Because there's some random variability inherent in the machine learning process. So this creates estimates which are robust to that variability. Um, and so measuring constitutional resonance for all the concepts of interest by this uh, vector cosine similarity. So that's the similarity between the vector of the concept with the vector for British constitution, which stands in for, for all sorts of references to the United Kingdom's constitution. So that's uh, the last I'll say about the technical stuff. So let's look at the results uh, from this endeavor. So um, first of all, off the unwrittenness of the UK's constitution, um, this plot here shows estimated changes in constitutional resonance of the term unwritten constitution over time with error bars for the 95% uh, confidence intervals alongside a baseline that's the shaded gray there uh, for the expectation of any just average noun that the, the average change in constitutional resonance of any of all nouns. Um, and so you can see here a statistically significant decline in cosine similarity for unwritten constitution and British constitution during the new labor era, uh, suggesting that the UK's constitution became less equated with the concept of an unwritten constitution during this time, and it drops again in the coalition era. And the, 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 that decreased level of constitutional resonance is sustained into the post-coalition era, um, which is consistent roughly with the theoretical expectations about the, the idea of the constitution being less associated with, its, with an unwritten form. Uh, turning to devolution and parliamentary sovereignty, so this plot shows estimated changes in constitutional resonance for those two concepts, again alongside a baseline average change for all nouns. Uh, and as expected, devolution is estimated to have gained a higher degree of constitutional resonance during the new labor era. That gain is relatively large, statistically significant, and is sustained over the, the next two periods of time. I think we would be surprised not to find this. In fact, I, I, I almost take this as, in a way, a kind of built-in validity test of, of the method that this turns up out to be the case. What's more provocative uh, is the result with respect to par parliamentary sovereignty. So we see uh, a significant decline in constitutional resonance for that concept um, during the new labor era, again, during the coalition era, and that lower degree of constitutional resonance uh, persists into the post-coalition era. Again, so this seems broadly consistent with claims or expectations that parliamentary sovereignty is a less significant concept for the meaning of the UK's constitution than it once was. Um, turning to human rights, and I pair it here with civil liberties, here the findings are less, much less conclusive. So uh, here, again, estimated changes in constitutional resonance for those two uh, concepts over time. Uh, we can see here that there isn't a significant gain in constitutional, there's a slight gain in constitutional resonance in the new labor era, but it's not statistically significant. Um, and then there's actually a decrease in the coalition era. And then finally in the post-coalition era, the concept of human rights seems to have gained a significant uh, amount of, uh, of greater constitutional resonance, which is strange because that's not what we would have expected. Why might it have uh, gained this extra constitutional resonance later and not earlier? Um, so I have a kind of a pet theory, which I talk about in the paper about why that might be. So having looked at the parliamentary debates in the post-coalition era, one thing that happens during that time is that proposals, concrete proposals for repealing the Human Rights Act are introduced into parliament. And in defense of the Human Rights Act, parliamentarians start speaking about human rights as part of the architecture, the constitutional architecture of the United Kingdom. So I suspect that this may be what's going on there, that there's a kind of defensive reaction in the discourse that generates this heightened constitutional resonance around the concept of human rights uh, 
in this latter period. But because the data stop in, in 2019, um, my text, my corpus stops then, I can't tell you if this is going to continue into the future. So I'd have to do a, some kind of follow-up study to see if this is a sustained or if it's a uh, gain or if it's just a blip. Uh, final slide here just shows the long-term uh, net change in constitutional resonance for all the concepts I've just talked about, plus a few other ones. Um, so a, a score of one would be perfect, uh, would mean that the concept is perfectly synonymous in the discourse with the notion of the British constitution. So you can see here that uh, still unwritten constitution, even though it has lost constitutional resonance, is still of the various concepts that we're talking about here, still the, the closest to being synonymous with the UK's constitution of all the concepts that we look at. Um, you can see here the, the, the big gains uh, in net gains and devolutions, constitutional resonance. You can also see the big uh, decrease uh, in the constitutional resonance of parliamentary sovereignty. And there's a couple other things here, which I could say more about in the Q&A, but I'll just go to the conclusion then to, to wrap up. So in conclusion, there does appear to have been semantic change in parliamentary discourse about the UK's constitution and this change broadly tracks theoretical expectations about the consequences of New Labour's reforms. Uh, notably, the extent to which the UK's constitution is equated with an unwritten form seems to have waned over time, and the constitutional resonance of parliamentary sovereignty appears to have also declined. But I would also add that there is uh, apparent uh, semantic continuity across all this time as well. So change has happened, but it doesn't seem to be as radical as some might have expected. It's not as though uh, the conceptual scheme of the UK's constitution has been completely scrambled uh, and uh, turned upside down. Uh, there are still a, a, great, a great deal of continuity is evident here as between the, the old constitution, so to speak, and the new constitution, even though we can see some significant changes in the discourse. So I will uh, stop there and uh, look forward to questions uh, later on. Thanks very much. Alex, thank you very much. Another really interesting presentation. They're all, so obviously there's a, there's a link, but they're all quite different. I'm not sure I really understand the sort of com computer side of things, but I think it probably has a lot of merit as a, as a tool. Um, okay, so we move to our last speaker, Lewis, and then we'll, have, we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm always, I'm always astounded by the, uh, the high quality of presentations of things like this. And here I am to, uh, ruin that. Let me find my share screen. Uh, wonderful. Is something coming up for you guys? Yeah. Okay. And am yes, I coming through? Okay. The audio is coming through. Okay. As well. Grand. Yep. All okay. fine. Cool. Um, so I'm going to speak on the topic of does the UK Supreme Court uh, care about underdogs. Um, David Robertson has remarked that cases, uh, meaning legal cases, uh, and perhaps he was specifically talking about UK Supreme Court cases, are in one way or another nearly all about power imbalances. If that's the case, and if judges are the arbiters of where the balance of power should fall, then it makes sense that we take a closer look at this. If legal cases regularly feature such imbalances, we may want to ask whose side are the judges on? Now, uh, people like uh, J.A.G. Griffith and other skeptical voices on the left have claimed that judges reinforce and strengthen societal power structures. They're allied with the powerful, they're against the underdogs. Uh, and this might not be because each and every judge is a, a capital C conservative or a small C conservative, but because of the, uh, the oh, my, my little pop-up window where my face is speaking is covering my text on. Let me just, uh, there we go. Perfect. Um, the whole process of becoming a judge and more specifically becoming a good judge is education and training for hierarchy. Those who, those who take on the role make an important investment in the elite status. There's something about the judicial role, says Morin, which uh, encourages a judge to side with the powerful, side with the elite against the underdog. Uh, 
And uh, Mon Laughlin says that uh, the cloistered environments of English public schools, Oxford colleges to the Inns of Court, and latterly in Parliament Square, creates a pipeline where certain types of judges, certain types of views, certain types of values uh, are going to be encouraged, are going to be sort of piped into the judiciary, and that's going to encourage judges to side against underdogs. Um, so I wanted to test whether that's true, whether the, in, in particular here with the UK Supreme Court, whether the judges in that court do side against underdogs, whether they do so under all circumstances, uh, whether certain judges side against underdogs, whether certain judges side with underdogs. Uh, and to do that, I considered um, <laughs> I considered doing what Alex did and doing a very sophisticated, technical, scientific study, uh, and then in the end decided to do what uh, Helen Tyrrell just called sophisticated counting, um, which I was much happier with. Um, so I decided to look at a corpus of judgments, and I decided to look at each judgment that was handed down by the UK Supreme Court, which featured an underdog dimension. And by underdog dimension, I broadly mean any case in which there is a, a difference between the two parties or some of the parties to the case in which one could be described as an underdog. So I used a, a, a quite a broad definition of underdog and I used a few different definitions. Um, underdog label can be applied to those who tend to hold particularly disadvantageous positions in society more generally, such as homeless people, prisoners, immigrants, or those facing deportation. Otherwise, usually the existence of a hierarchical relationship was the key. So you've got a big powerful boss versus a comparatively weaker employee. The underdog in that case is going to be the employee. Um, the underdog in discrimination cases, generally the party claiming unfair treatment, uh, generally in citizen state cases, the ordinary citizen will be considered the underdog. They tend to have less resources, less power than the state. Um, and even if there's no hierarchical relationship, one party with a lot of wealth, a lot of power, a lot of resources against, you know, an, an quote unquote ordinary citizen will tend to engage the underdog dimension as well. These are very broad. There are cases in which these models don't fit. There are cases in which a sort of subjective valuation had to replace a kind of coding metric. But at the end of the day, I was able to find a number of cases, uh, I'll talk about this in a second, under which, uh, in which the UK Supreme Court deals with an underdog. And this is what I found. So I found 389 cases out of about 600 and 82. So I only looked until around mid 2019, uh, the Supreme Court's first 10 years. So 389 out of 620, that's, uh, I'm bad at math, but that's more than half, uh, featured a, a clear underdog dimension. And if you simply look at unambiguous coding, then there are more cases in which the Supreme Court finds against the underdog than finds for the underdog. However, there's this category of mixed findings, which Cases are not neat, cases are not tidy, you often have multiple parties. There'll often be a case where, say, there are three claimants and the Supreme Court says, we're going to find for one, we're going to find against the other, and the third one somewhere in between. Or the case is just so ambiguous and the, the case is so complicated that you can't easily say that this is a finding for or against an underdog. Often the ratio of a case, the finding of a case, uh, falls somewhere in between. Uh, but taking that another way, you could say that in about 200 cases out of 389, so more than half of applicable cases, the court makes some finding in favor of an underdog, which will go against the kind of Griffith idea that judges just don't care about underdogs at all. Um, I was also interested in the individual judges on the Supreme Court. This tells you, this table here tells you a little bit, it doesn't tell you too much. Um, it's unlikely that all judges behave the same way. Um, the presentations we've looked at today, particularly Rachel's, will make that very clear. And so I decided to look not only at the cases and what the overall court outcomes told us, but what the individual judges within those cases tended and how they tended to vote. Um, so on the next slide, I'll put my results, but I just wanna say that 20 judges over this 10 year period 
uh, decided enough cases to produce usable data. Um, and this, uh, this range of positions ranges from about 35% of the time, Lord Newberger. So in other words, in 35% of relevant cases where there's an underdog dimension, Lord Newberger sided with the underdog in 35% of cases. On the other side of the table, about 60%, we've got Lord Kerr. So in relevant cases where there's an underdog dimension, where the part, one of the parties is an underdog, Lord Kerr sided with that underdog in 60% of cases. Lloyd Jones there is just highlighted because uh, his data was not particularly strong. So he's, his data is possibly not particularly useful, but he sits in the middle anyway. Um, average score here is about 47%. Uh, relatively standard, relatively low standard deviation. Um, and what does this tell us? Well, on the one hand, if you compare Lord Newberger and Lord Kerr, you can, you know, it, it looks like one of these judges cares about underdogs and one of the judges doesn't, but actually there's not too much difference if you look between the judges at each point. And you could just say, and I've looked at the statistical significance of this, there's slight significance, but it's, it tends towards a kind of a slightly, slightly random variation. So instead I looked at something called salient cases, which is similar to dissenting cases. This is a case in which within the same panel, within the same case, different judges come to different conclusions about the underdog question. Now this is usually whether a judge is in the majority or in, in the minority, but not always. Sometimes, for example, uh, a certain judge will, uh, judges will come to the same overall conclusions uh, in a case they'll find, you know, uh, a statute needs to be read in a certain way, or a, uh, there's liability on this party, but not others. But certain judges will emphasize an underdog aspect and certain judges won't. And we see a bit more variation when you look at these uh, underdog cases. And I'm just checking my notes here to see if I've written down how many cases we have here. Um, yeah, so I've got 87 relevant cases, so smaller sample size, but still quite a few. And here we see the difference between the judges does start to come out a little bit more. Um, Lady Helen Lord Kerr on the right hand side there, um, they're hidden by my, by my face again, but I can definitely remember where they came on the chart. Um, they were much more likely than other judges to find for the underdog in underdog cases where the underdog dimension was salient. On the other side, you've got judges like Lord Hodge, Lord Brown, Lord Newberger, Hughes, Sumption, Walker, they're all 20% or lower. So one in five salient cases to decide with the underdog. Um, interestingly, you can also remove Lady Hale and Lord Kerr and redo the analysis. So I suppose cases where but for Hale and Kerr, the case would remain salient. So there are lots of cases where Lady Hale and Lord Kerr say, we're going to dissent. If you take out those cases and say, but for those votes, would there still be a split? You also get this, um, which again, is just a slightly different way of looking at it. But again, you have some variance between the judges. And um, you can also magically change the colors of a chart to produce something else, which looks more, <laughs> looks more interesting. And you get these two kind of flanks, I suppose, of judges who I guess you could argue are slightly more pro underdog and the judges on the left, who I guess you could argue are slightly less underdog. Again, with the caveat that Lady Hale and Lord Kerr are the most pro underdog of them all. Um, now, does this mean that judges, that Lady Hale and Lord Kerr or Lord Hodge and Brown or whoever are just deciding cases because they sympathize with an underdog? They're deciding a case in favor of an underdog because they have sympathy for the underdog. No, for a number of reasons. First of all, the usual, usual caveat in any empirical project like uh, of this nature. This is all about causation. It's also bare causation. Uh, it's a very, very, very rough rubric to be judging judicial behavior by. Secondly, there's a lot of overlap between the data on whether judges side with an underdog and whether judges do other things. For example, side with the state, side uh, with human people claiming human rights breaches. Um, and I'll come to that in a second. Uh, and thirdly, just to underscore, judges that vote in ways which preference the underdog are not necessarily voting in order to benefit an underdog. Certain judicial philosophies, interpretive tools, and understandings of the judicial role might lead to this kind of result uh, and a kind of behavior 
which is, for example, more generous to an underdog than not. But that's not the same thing as saying that judges are expressly, I don't know, hijacking the law to side with the little guy. So just on, on, on correlation with other factors. So there are, you know, this was just looking at one factor of un parties, how judges treated underdog parties. There are so many other things we could look for and so many other correlations we could try to assess. But one of them was whether judges side with the state. And again, I could show you data which shows that certain judges are more likely than others to side with the state. But here's an interesting graph which shows uh, which judges are more likely to side with the underdog when the state is not involved. So you remove any judicial review cases, you remove any uh, well public law cases, really. Um, and so these are cases employer versus employee, uh, where you're talking about um, a landlord against a tenant, cases like that. And you have a slightly different order, although a lot of similarities with the, the previous uh, data. So Lord Dyson here appears to be much more pro-underdog when this kind of setup is, is tested, um, which suggests that Lord Dyson cares about underdogs, but also has a sort of fidelity to the state and behaves a little bit differently in public law cases compared to private law cases. Um, you have people like Hale and Kerr, who still appear to be pro-underdog, whether the state is involved or not. Um, so you can do this, and I have done this, and I won't bore you with it, but there are lots of kind of slices you can do where you take out certain variables, add others in, move them around to see whether you get different uh, different outcomes. And here's a very unhelpful table that, uh, that I, I kept purely because it looks quite pretty and it's not particularly illuminating, but certain judges tend to side with the underdog more in state cases than non-state cases. So there's Lord Dyson towards the right, who the blue uh, the blue line shows he's more likely to side with the underdog when the state's involved. Sorry, he's more likely to side with, um, ah, my labeling is the wrong way around. That's why I'm getting confused. Lord Dyson is much more likely to side with the underdog when the state is not involved compared to when the state is involved. Now, these graphs are, uh, the previous graphs tell us something, something useful-ish, I suppose, but it's hard to compare a random graph in this chart with a random graph in this chart because the averages are all different. Judges are much more likely as a whole to do X in certain circumstances compared to Y in certain circumstances. So the raw numbers are not particularly helpful. What these charts do is for each judge, I set out how much more likely a given judge is to side with the underdog or side with the state or side with the underdog when there's no state, et cetera, et cetera, compared to your average judge over that 10 year period. So Lord Kerr was 1.88 times as, well, I suppose, 188% more likely to side with the underdog generally than your average judge and against the state, he's uh, 1.96 times as likely than your average judge. Um, and that's kind of across the board. And Lord Walker, generally unlikely to side with underdogs compared to your average judge, generally unlikely to side with the state compared to your average judge, but particularly there against the state when there's no underdog, he is really very unlikely to side with the underdog compared to other judges. But some judges are not so uniform. So Lord Toulson, for example, the asterisk there is because my data's crap, so we can just pretend that isn't the case. Um, the, he's relatively unlikely to side with the underdog. He's a little unlikely to side with the state, but strangely in cases against the state without an underdog present, he's really likely to go to town on the state, which is a really interesting dimension. It's a kind of a holding the state to account, except where there's a, the little guy involved, in which case <laughs> screw him. <laughs> um, and then Lord Clark. Again, he's relatively likely to, a little likely to side with the underdog, slightly likely to side against the state, but particularly likely to side against the state when there's not an underdog involved. Now, these are all so rough and they're all, again, most of these are correlation rather than causation. And they're only a partial insight into lots of different tests and databases that you can pull together. But I hope it's shown a little flavor of the idea that individual judges have some slightly different approaches to different parties, including underdogs. So the question, uh, does the identity of parties to a case matter for judicial decision-making? I think the answer is yes. I think it really does. Does this show that judges are forgoing their role uh, and siding with which other party attracts their sympathy? No, it doesn't. I don't think that shows that at all. And does this show that judges are deciding cases in certain ways, at least in part, 
due to their preferences relating to underdogs. I put maybe. I don't think the data shows that in certain cases, especially when you look at people like Lady Hale and Lord Kerr. I think it uh, it does suggest that quite heavily. But you know, that could be for lots of reasons, and it takes a lot more data, a lot more correlation, someone a lot cleverer than me to be able to answer those questions definitively. But I hope this was at least a little bit interesting, and uh, look forward to any comments and questions. That's great. Thanks so much for that, Lewis. Very interesting talk. Um, I think um, Eloise and I are going to take the privilege of uh, being chairs and just ask a couple questions and make a couple of comments here and there. Um, and uh, I'm going to start uh, with Nicolaj. Um, I thought your, your presentation uh, was very interesting. I was wondering, what are some of the kind of the doctrinal implications of, of what you want to do? I mean, I kept thinking uh, that maybe you could kind of articulate the problem. Were you saying that there was a problem with the judiciary and the way that some of the, the doctrine was being handed out in terms of kind of classifying employees versus contractors? And is your kind of attempt to potentially kind of take that away from the courts in terms of, look, they're doing, you know, a not very good job here in terms of kind of some of this doctrine. And I'm trying to kind of put something forward that would potentially take that away from the court. So I wasn't quite sure uh, what some of the implications were there in terms of uh, what you were proposing, but that was just one question that I had in mind. Um, Rachel, I think it's fascinating some of your work, and I kept thinking of, and I don't know if you've read it or not, but Melvin Urofsky's uh, Dissent in the Supreme Court, I think is a fantastic uh, recent book in relation to the US Supreme Court. Uh, but from the UK context, I found it fascinating that probably the more polarized we've become over these last few years, the more unified the Supreme Court has become, which I just think is bizarre because usually you see courts kind of, you know, uh, uh, being kind of a mirror uh, of, of how, how the, the populace is. And here we see the opposite. Um, but I also wonder, I mean, one thing is we don't see, uh, of course, we can't see a lot of the conversations that take place, you know, behind the scenes, right? And that's not to say that even though dissent has, you know, not been as prevalent, that's not saying that there hasn't been a lot of dissent behind the scenes, right? Um, so there definitely could have been, we just don't know about it. Um, and then also, you know, wouldn't, uh, just to push back a little bit in terms of dissent being a good thing, you know, what if people are worried about kind of institutionally, you know, in terms of uh, dissent, uh, maybe making for a more fractious kind of court and, you know, especially kind of behind the scenes as well, they're worried about the relationships with other justices. So maybe in that sense, dissent is not necessarily a good thing uh, for the justices, but that's, that's just a, a, a question. Um, for Alex, um, uh, yeah, fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, work in terms of kind of uh, uh, that semantic analysis. Um, I think one of the things that kind of uh, struck me is uh, if parliamentary sovereignty and kind of, you know, that is one of the, uh, the items that has, that has kind of decreased over the years. I think kind of a little bit of irony to that is, you know, isn't it parliamentary sovereignty that allowed the 1997 uh, constitutional changes and beyond to basically go through, right? I mean, if parliamentary sovereignty wasn't in place, um, then maybe a lot of these changes wouldn't have happened. And especially the case with, you know, the Constitutional Reform Act 2005, which, you know, was very much kind of ad hoc. So if parliamentary sovereignty is decreasing, does that mean, you know, that we're potentially, you know, more stable or, or not as much constitutional change is going to happen. Um, so I think there's some really uh, interesting implications there. And then also, I mean, how do you square your findings with something like Brexit, right? Which was really parliamentary sovereignty focused, or at least there was some element of kind of parliamentary sovereignty there, right? Um, and a lot of people may not explicitly have said parliamentary sovereignty. Maybe, maybe MP said something like, you know, we don't need, uh, you know, Europe to tell us what to do anymore, right? Which may not necessarily fit into your semantic um, um, analysis there. Um, so, so that's one question I had. And then Lewis, um, I think really, really fascinating um, in terms of kind of uh, what you found there. I was wondering, 
if you could develop maybe your definition of underdog uh, a bit more. Um, uh, there's, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of some of the work, you know, by Mark Galanter in terms of the haves versus the have nots. And then also I was thinking when you were presenting of uh, Donald Black's uh, The Behavior of Law, which also talks about this idea of, you know, repeat players versus newcomers. And, you know, a lot of the dynamics that you talk about there, I think Donald Black also uh, talks a lot as well. So I was just thinking that, you know, maybe you could kind of make your, your definition of, of underdog maybe a little bit more robust there. Um, but I think is you know really fascinating work. And um, Eloise, over to you uh, in terms of uh, questions. Sorry, I have two screens and the mouse doesn't move the right way between them. Um, I only have really one question, and I think it's predominantly directed at Rachel. Um, but actually, it might be something that some others might also want to respond to. And uh, it's, it's there's really an underpinning idea I have that I don't think is unusual, and it's sort of leads me to think about this question. So I suppose it's really saying not that dissent is a bad thing, but how independent minded do we really want the most senior judges to be? Do we not want to believe that they will judge correctly and therefore there'll be a limited range of responses or decisions that they can make? And, and I suppose what might perhaps be concerning, and perhaps this is shown by, in fact, much of what we've seen today, um, that an increased variance in approach, perhaps stemming from the president of the Supreme Court, we could run a risk of a less neutral court overall. And I think I'm particularly thinking, I mean, in, in terms of with Lady Hale, you know, would we have seen different outcomes in a whole host of different controversial cases had we had a different president at the helm? Um, and I think we're already seeing perhaps that with Lord Reid. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's really just trying to get at to what extent do we want them to be independent minded as opposed to collegiate? And is there a risk that that skews the, the, the balance of the court and skews the, the approach? I think the lead does seem to come from the president more than it ever did historically when they were the, you know, the Lords of Appeal and Ordinary. So really for Rachel, but also anybody else who has a, has a view on that one. I know that we also have questions in the chat. Um, would, would you like to go ahead and take a stab at these and then we can get to the questions in the chat? Does that sound good? Yep. Uh, Mikawai, would you like to go first? Sure, sure, no problem. Um, so, so referring both to your question, Brian, and to um, the questions from the chat, uh, um, so what to do about uh, what to do about those outlier judges so so we may we we could end up uh, with a robust finding and and that by the way is not obvious because there may be data issues and other data issues that that would uh, prevent uh, um, prevent us from making any conclusions about like systematic differences between individual judges especially if it's like an area of law or a court where there aren't that many decisions so so it's not obvious that there would be something interesting to uh, to say about individual judges but it could be that for example we learned that uh, uh, the way and it's systematically the case that the way the judges apply the law uh, is different from an academic picture not necessarily that it's problematic but it's just that it's different so that's an interesting finding that would not necessarily call for a legal change but just for adjusting the uh, so sort of the academic picture of uh, of uh, what the law uh, looks like at least uh, uh, at least in practice right uh, but it is possible that we could have robust findings of problematic uh, uh, so, so, so problematic differences between w the way we academics and others imagine the law should work and the, uh, how it actually works. And then, um, so, so yes, that for example, that some judges or many judges systematically decide based on issues which should be legally irrelevant or that they misapply uh, the law and that's um, quite uncontroversial that they are misapplying the law. So the possible solutions I see, I think one, one issue is, uh, maybe I'm naive about this, but it seems to me that uh, publicizing this, even without the names uh, of, of judges, but just making it clear, showing that, well, this is happening in this area of law, um, and that combined perhaps with some training for judges that could go some way to addressing the issue if such issue is, is found. And, the, and uh, if that's not enough, then perhaps 
uh, there, there could be an argument for, for example, for making, um, for yes, for, for taking away some uh, discretion from judges and making statutory tests a bit more um, specific if need be, but that has its own problems. Uh, I, I, in general, just uh, also answering the, to, to the written questions, I really don't like the French uh, approach. I think uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm sure many uh, have heard about this uh, rule that basically censors statistical research that uses uh, identity of a French judge as a parameter. I think that's an embarrassment for the French legal system and for the French judiciary, and uh, they should really um, uh, yeah, they, they should just really uh, abolish that rule. So the, um, the, not, not much more to say about this one. Um, there, there may be, I can see the, I can see the, uh, the, the question about publishing results which are more sensationalistic or not robust enough. And, but, uh, but, but, uh, but on the other hand, the interest in open justice and and uh, and then well, uh, critical uh, well, critical studies of law. I think of, of um, this is sufficient that judges should should just have a bit uh, thicker skin. Um, so yes, so much, um, Rachel. Did you want to respond? Uh, there's so many questions there, aren't there? So I suppose the question is about public view of consensus and conformity and perhaps dissent should be limited or maybe it's a good thing that we don't see disagreement. Um, and I think that speaks to Erin's uh, comment as well in the chat about this idea at which point should the president uh, consider wider politics and, and ensure that there's consensus. And I think we saw that in Miller. I think there was a judge or two in that decision, I don't think agreed, but we didn't see that publicly. Um, I suppose my concern about the absence of overt dissent is based, is also grounded in the absence of diversity. It's also grounded in the absence of transparency in decision-making and reasoning. And whilst I totally agree that if we had a very diverse judiciary drawn from all sorts of different areas, we knew different views were being presented in the court and that we weren't perpetuating perhaps not overt bias, but maybe more subtle biases that, you know, preference certain positions, legal positions, then I would be happy that they decide that there's giving an individual consensus of judgment, but that just doesn't exist. And when they're choosing one case out of every four to hear that have a right to be heard in the court, the cases they're hearing are cases that society are divided on. For a large amount of these cases where dissent used to emerge and is now starting to disappear are cases that are quite controversial in society. So the idea that the court can reach one consensus position, I think, is almost detrimental to the court rather than an advantage to it. But also, I, I need to know that behind the scenes they're being challenged. And I think Alan suggests that that is true. But while we start to appoint people who are perhaps more overtly neutral to the court, I would question, and I think this speaks to what Eloise was suggesting, there's really significant evidence that if you have a dominant president or a dominant person in any panel where there aren't equally dominant people on that panel, one view, one position starts to permeate all these decisions where we are entrusting five people with five very different views to reach the decision. And I think overt dissent and, and perhaps sacrificing some, I, I think I understand the discussions about collegiality and collegiate working and everything, but collegiality can also silence minority voices. Collegiality can silence debate and discussion. And, and so I am increasingly concerned about the overt evidence of silence. Thank you for that. I, does that Thanks. answer it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we won't ask you what you think about kind of the unanimity in uh, Miller too. We could save that for another day. <laughs> um, 
Alex. Uh, thanks so much. So I'll try to follow uh, Mikawai's approach and um, bundle uh, my answer to your question, Brian, together with a few of the of the uh, questions from from our our virtual uh, attendees. So um, yes, absolutely, the legal fact, if you want to call it that, of parliamentary sovereignty uh, is it has facilitated uh, various formal changes. And I mean, we can think that. Uh, so I lend this a causal interpretation, but I don't actually have a way to, at least not with the methods that I'm using here, to demonstrate that there is a causal connection between the discursive change that I observe and the formal changes that occurred. I'm just putting those two together and saying, look at the sequencing and it's suggestive of perhaps a causal interpretation. So the the... The, the trajectory of semantic change is broadly consistent with expectations which have a causal kind of nature to them about those reforms prompting changes in the discourse. Um, one thing that this method doesn't address uh, is, I mean, there are ways that you could do it, but I'm, I'm not interested particularly in what's politically salient. I'm interested in what's become constitutionally resonant. So how, do, how would I distinguish those two? So lots of issues are politically contentious and parliamentarians argue about them, but that doesn't make them less, more or less synonymous with ideas of the British constitution, right? So this is about where particular concepts, you might say, have become more or less uh, like a synonym for the UK constitution. So we can start off in a position before where the concept of parliamentary sovereignty was closer to approximating a synonym for the UK constitution. And that approximation of synonymity has declined over time. Why is it declined? Well, one way to think about it is that a bunch of other things have crept in. So think of it as a box in which the meaning of the UK constitution is, is contained. And that box used to just be the, the only occupant of that box or one perhaps one of the most important occupant of that box was parliamentary sovereignty, and it's still one of the most important occupants of that box, but there are other elements in there now which have a greater, which are taking up more room, let's say, right? So, so devolution definitely is taking much more space in that box. So you might think that maybe there's a finite, I mean, this is me just speculating, there's only so much meaning you can cram into a concept, perhaps, in the discourse so, you know, as other ideas come in to be more equated with the idea of the UK's constitution, inevitably concepts that were previously more dominant perhaps are, uh, are, are diminished to some extent in their constitutional resonance, as I've called it. Now, what are the practical implications of this? Does it mean that there will be a legal difference in how parliamentary sovereignty is actually, um, actually, actually plays out? Um, maybe maybe down the road, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there's any sign of this happening anytime soon, at least, you know, the, the, the decrease in constitutional resonance there isn't enough to suggest that people are no longer thinking of it as a constitutionally relevant concept. It still is relatively ranked in that list of concepts, at least that I show there. It's still relatively important in parliamentary discourse. Um, another point to make, which goes to one of the questions is like, would there be differences in the discourse as between political parties? Probably, and there are ways that you could do that. There's one corpus of Hansard um, text, which actually, uh, you know, has a party identifier for, for the different speakers in parliament. So you could show that there's like a labor semantic universe in which these uh, relationships might very well be different from the way the conservative party talk about it. And I haven't parsed that out here. I've just treated all the debates as one big bag of, 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 of text to analyze. Uh, and only distinguish them according to the time in which they, the debate occurs. So there's definitely, I think, interesting things that you could find that way. Uh, another person asks, you know, just to just to kind of address some of the questions of things that I didn't do in this in this uh, paper. Um, uh, why did I look at parliamentary debates and not say judicial decisions? I mean, one reason is accessibility. It's super easy to scrape the Hansard with Python, which is what I code. And I think Mika Y also codes in Python and that just is a practical consideration. But also I think there's a substantive reason to do that is that if we're talking about the way concepts are deployed in discourse, not in terms of like legal judgment, but in terms of how people talk about things, then parliamentary debate is, you might say, the main forum for where the political aspect of the constitution happens. So the informal nature of it, 
I think is probably, it's, it seems more appropriate in that context, but you could certainly do the same thing with judicial decisions as well, with a caveat that I imagine judges are more constrained in the way they speak about these concepts um, than parliamentarians are. So I kind of like that parliamentarians are less constrained and they can perhaps be uh, signaling discursive change or rather picking up discursive change is more likely, I thought, to be sort of evident in parliamentary discourse uh, than, than uh, judicial decision making, but I think it's worth looking at as well. I, I, I would be very interested in doing that. Someone also asked about why not sentiment analysis. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, that would be interesting too, right? So our, 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 and that would be a separate project about how, what is the valence of, of the discourse around particular concepts is, this goes back to something that one of you said about, you know, people being angry about whether parliamentary sovereignty is being compromised or not is the sort of thing you could, you might be able to pick up through sentiment analysis. And then finally, I think Aaron Delaney asks a great question about semantic inconsistency as between the various concepts. So, but the other concepts that I look at, not the British constitution concept, the sort of master concept, but the other concepts like the rule of law, separation of powers, parliamentary sovereignty and so on, I, I think that I have the material to do that. So the models that I've tr trained could actually, if I, if I wanted to, I could, after this talk, come back to you with estimates of how those concepts have moved closer or farther from each other uh, semantically over time. So is, for example, is there more semantic dissonance, let's put it that way, between parliamentary sovereignty and the separation of powers now than before, or perhaps during debates over the Constitutional Reform Act, um, maybe you could find that sort of thing. So there's there's a lot more, I think, to be done with these methods. I sort of started with, I think, you know, what I thought of was, was the kind of most accessible and most to the point uh, with respect to the theoretical expectations that I elicited from the, the literature. But uh, so anyway, thanks very much for, for the really thought-provoking questions. It was a pleasure to think through the answers. Thanks a lot, Alex. Um, Lewis, did you want to go ahead and uh, respond to anything? Is Lewis still with us? Um, if not, I was going to- not, no. No, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I think there's some questions from Aaron Delaney um, and then uh, Veronica um, and Paolo as well. Uh, Aaron, would you like to go ahead and uh, ask a couple of your questions? Oh, uh, Brian, I should say that um, our format, the CCPL format for these sessions doesn't actually allow the attendees to. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, no worries. Uh... Yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll just, I'll just. I can, uh, I, can, I can read Aaron's and Veronica, which might save you a bit of. Yeah, work go for it, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but I think I've tried to address Aaron's um, when I was making my comments at the start. I think. I think Erin is right. I think there are decisions in specific cases that a, a, a court, a collegiate court, and perhaps the president of the court makes a decision where um, consensus, the value of consensus outweighs the value of dissent. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, I'm not sure that the UK Supreme Court in, in uh, like American courts where we know division is happening behind the scenes ha because of the political nature of appointments. Um, I'm not sure then in a context in the UK where there is no political appointment that we have the homogeneity of justices that would allow us to kind of uh, support consistent and continuous uh, concurrence. And as for Veronica, I think you're right. I think that, so there is a freshman effect and various different effects that play a play inside the court. Uh, initially, justices don't dissent when they join the court. They are quiet for at least a year, with the exception of Lord Sumption. Um, they don't dissent when they join the court. So there is a kind of hangover effect, absolutely, when the court opened, both because of the way 
decision making and encouragement um, to write your own opinion in the House of Lords. So there was a hangover effect, no question. But I'm not sure that that hangover effect is the only effect that has happened for the duration of the court. And you're right. I, statistical analysis, we could do it, but they hear much less cases. Um, in some years, we're talking 50 cases rather than the hundreds of cases that are usually used for analysis, but we can do it. That's great. And Alex, it looks like you had quite a number of questions in the chat, but they've you answered them in your response. Is that right? I think so. I mean, to the best of my my limited abilities, <laughs> I did. They were they were very good questions. So um, I, I tried to get all of them, uh, uh, you know, in in at least at least in a, a bare pass uh, <laughs> with respect to the answers. <laughs> Can, can I just add one other thing? I, I have a feeling that most um, uh, most people attending the conference and indeed the rest of us would probably like to be able to spend uh, look through the slides again and, and look at papers. I'm just wondering, I know Brian and I have been given them, but wh when might they be available or might they be available for other attendees to access? I'm uh, certainly happy to make send mine uh, out uh, along with the paper to anyone who is present today. So we'll just use the registration list for the event uh, as, a, as an email list, if that's all right with the participants. Uh, we, we can certainly send the papers and the slides out to everybody that way. I think, Eloise, great. you've seen how unprepared my paper is. I'm more than happy to share the slides, but the paper's so far away from anything. I think it's just consideration. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was excellent, but I think I think also just as we're all getting towards the, the sort of beginning of term and this sort of blended learning and so on, actually the ability to share other people's you know, resources in the way that we wouldn't have necessarily been able to do as easily before and properly accredit them, I think is something new. And I just think it, it's a it's a sort of perhaps a newer debate or a, a more nuanced or more interesting discussion, particularly for sort of you know students, you know undergraduate students of public law to, to sort of engage in. So I think it would be really useful. Brian, do you have anything else? Um, I was just going to ask, how did you all come together? Was this kind of a, uh, the beginnings of kind of a special issue or something like that? Or how did you guys uh, get together and, and kind of work out this, this webinar? Alex. I, I, I attribute everything to Alex. <laughs> I was I'm I'm very keen on promoting uh empirical and computational research in UK public law so I was like I just thought well, there's all these people I know about are doing interesting stuff so I was like why don't we get together and and uh do an event together because it's uh I've been you know I've been noticing uh Rachel's work for a long time Lewis's work for a long time Miko Wai's work so I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to get, um, you know, I mean, it's interesting, it's rare, I think computational research is really rare and still pretty rare to get uh, statistical or quantitative approaches to public law in the UK context. So it seems, you know, there's a bit of a, a desire to kind of bring us together and have a bit of strength in numbers maybe. Uh, uh, and, you know, intellectually, it's really stimulating for me to, to listen to um, their work and get to discuss it. So it's, you know, that was, it was probably, you know, very self-serving motivations. <laughs> I think That's Alex great. makes a really good point though. Uh, empirical research, we've just done a study, a review of papers in the UK and journals, kind of general law journals in the UK. Empirical research in those journals, particularly quant, is extremely rare. Mm. Yeah, and Alex, Erin uh, Delaney said that uh, she would like to talk more as well, that she's involved in a project for the JCPC. Um, Absolutely. Have, Absolutely. Very good. Do we have any more questions from the chat that we missed? No, I think lots of people are coming back to sort of say that their questions have been answered thoroughly and, and they've, you know, found it really useful. So I think, I think we've probably, I suppose this is the last chance for anyone attending to, to type something in if they wish to. So I think, I think it's been really rather thorough, hasn't it? Comprehensive.
There was one question, just, I, I can't remember who asked it, but I, see, I did see a question saying, were, were any of the methods that we have, any of, all of us have applied in our various respective projects applicable to maritime decisions? And I don't see maritime law decisions. I don't see any reason why not. So I think all of the various mm -hmm. methods here, they're not really tied or wedded to um, any particular domain of law. I think that um, what Mikawai is doing, the similar sorts of method, that method could be applied in, across different areas of law. Likewise, what I'm doing and Rachel as well, and, um, and uh, what Lewis is doing. So I think this, these are broadly applicable approaches, I think, beyond the public law domain or the particular subdomains that we were all looking at. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, you know, what you guys are doing, a lot of you are looking far beyond public law, right, in terms of kind of what's happening, you know, with the UK Supreme Court, or uh, maybe kind of some other, um, some other kind of instances as well. So yeah, it's not, it's not just public law. I think there's a wide scope for kind of what's happening with UK law generally. Um, so yeah, I think it's some really interesting work um, that you guys are doing. Um, if there's not anything else, should we should we wrap up? Um, I'd like to just go ahead and thank you know uh, Alex for uh, reaching out and uh, thank um, the University of Hong Kong um, and the Center for Comparative Public Law. Um, as well for the invitation uh, and to the SLS for being willing uh, to sponsor this as well. Um, it's something that, you know, we, we had trouble fitting it into the, the public section, but I'm so glad that we got the opportunity to do this because I think there was an even uh, wider audience uh, that we caught uh, by doing this. Um, so thanks so much uh, for that. Um, Eloise, did you want to, to say anything? I'm I was just going to say as our sort of last thing as co-conveners before we sort of handed over or having handed over, it's a really nice high note to end on, isn't it? A really interesting and good session. So it's actually been really Absolutely. lovely for us to extend the sort of the, the sort of session a bit further by having this. Uh, well, let me let me just thank you both, uh, Eloise and Brian, so much for 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 doing this. I mean, it was it was really we're very, very grateful for the involvement of the SLS public. Uh, section and particularly to have you both uh, involved in this was really a, a treat for for us. So thank you very much for for this. Oh, it was an honor to be involved. Thanks a lot for asking. No, thank you. And I think we need to thank you, Alex, for bringing this whole thing together, <laughs> for contacting the SLS and doing everything. So, and those behind the scenes who set up the webinar. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. I, I'll just throw in a word of thanks there to Winnie Law from the Center for Comparative Public Law, who, as always, makes everything run like magic. So thank you, Winnie, for your assistance once again. All right. Well, I guess we will say goodbye. <laughs> I, hope <laughs> every, I hope to see everybody in person uh, sometime, sometimes sooner rather than later, I hope.